Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're in the Christmas season. We're going to be talking about gifts, but not the kind of gifts that you think when I say that right off the bat. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God has been good to us and he's given us gifts. The church at Corinth had been given a number of gifts, and I want to encourage you to think about them kind of like you think about a gift for Christmas, uh, something that you can use daily and in your life. Uh, You know, it's, there's, in a sense, almost nothing better than getting such a, a useful gift on Christmas that you can use all the time. It's not just something that, you know, you, you set aside and don't use often or at all, or, you know, it's, it's not like the packaging that it came in. I mean, sometimes when you give a gift to a, a child, a young child, you know what they like, right? The box, they don't like the gift itself. And, and, and it also reminds us that, you know, you get one gift and somebody else gets another gift, but you don't all get the same gift, and you shouldn't be sad about that, although sometimes children are when they receive a gift, right? They want... They want what brother or sister got, not what they got. There's always that grass is greener kind of thing going on. And that sort of thing was happening in Corinth, only the problem was it wasn't about the packaging or uh, it wasn't children. It wasn't a secular context. It was in the church. And they had some serious problems. We already know they had serious problems, but they were exposed and expressed in this matter that we're looking at in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which we've done now for a couple of weeks. We come to uh, the third section, which I've taken as one long section down to the end of the chapter, but then I found out I'm going to have to uh, break it into a couple of parts, so that's what we'll do. God has carefully composed the church to carry out his work. That's our title today. He's carefully composed the church to carry out his work. In other words, he's carefully constructed the assembly And as I began my preparation for this message, I began to think that perhaps God would have a message for us that is Fellowship Bible Church, not just us in some generic sense that you can let, you know, go on to uh, the next person down the line and not have to think about yourself, but for us ourselves, that he might have a little critique for us along this line. Many of us who are members at FBC here know in our heads that we're members of one body and therefore members of one another. Now, there are some who don't know that yet or don't understand that because they're new in the faith or haven't been taught that, and we'll get, they'll get that in our messages here. But there are some of us who have a very shallow understanding of our part in the local church. We don't understand yet by, by a real realization that we are members of a body with every other person in this church the Lord might critique us and say, it seems that you may be living a little bit more independently than you ought. Holding other church members at arm's length, being kind of independent units, free agents, if you will. Yeah, I'm loosely associated with that assembly, but not too closely. I don't want to get too, too much into it. It has not dawned on everyone in the church how the one body and many member idea should guide our conduct, our emotions, our attitudes. And this would cause us to think differently about one another, think differently about how we live together, think differently about how we minister together, just think differently about how we think about one another. That would be the critique that I wonder if God would have for us today as we look at this passage. This is given, of course, by inspiration of God, meaning God breathed it out. It's profitable for our doctrine, for teaching, for correcting us, for instructing us in righteousness and guiding us along the right path, for reproving us when we're wrong. And too often, I think, we come to the text of Scripture and we kind of read it, uh, and, and maybe especially in a corporate sense, and we just kind of gloss over what it might mean for our church. And I hope that's not the case today with us, each one. So let's see if we can grasp the idea better uh, that Paul is getting across here of one body, many members, and different 
gifts. And I started the message just by summarizing from verses 12 through 31 because there's so many ideas here. I want to just lay those out for you and have you think about them briefly with me. And then we'll start to touch on a couple of them in greater detail. Paul starts out, well, actually, let me just read it, and then we'll touch on the truths and then go into some detail. Starting in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. If you would just follow along as I read here from the New King James Version. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ, or so also is the Messiah. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Is that true? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. Now follow, uh, try to follow the whole message through here because by the end you're going to see what Paul is doing with these, these texts here. It seems like it's repetitive, but it's not as repetitive as you might think. And the eye, verse 21, cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. Now just pause and notice a little detail. You have body parts here, members, verse 22, which are weaker you have some that are less honorable, and you have some that are unpresentable. Then you have ones that are, on the other hand, stronger, more honorable, and presentable. Three features or characteristics of certain of these gifts. And when I've read through that over the years, I've not really paused to notice that, that he's calling out these elements or these ideas of these body parts here. We'll touch on those again later. Verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Now, another word you can use for the word member is part. Okay, it's just It's the word for a part that makes up a whole. So I could read this verse 26 this way, and if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and parts, members, individually. Verse 28, And God has appointed these in the church. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Here's a prioritized list. Uh, third, teachers. After that, miracles. Then, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, variety of tongues, or varieties, rather, of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? You could probably count those questions and give a little answer in your notes to each one of those. But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. So let's just review what we've learned. Number one, the body of Christ is one. It is united, and it is a part of Him. Secondly, the body of Christ has many members or many parts to it. Thirdly, the body of Christ was brought together by what means? What means brought the body of Christ together? Do you see it in verse 13? Now, now I'm asking you to think. I shouldn't have done that. 
Spirit baptism is what brings the body together. Okay? That's, that is a critical piece of truth right there because people get so turned around and confused about spirit baptism, what it's for and why it is. He tells us. It's, it's actually an explanation. If you look at the beginning of verse 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized. That's the explanation of verse 12. How is it that we being many are one body? Because you've been glued together by spirit baptism into the body of Christ. You've been put together that way, assembled by spirit baptism. Number four, every member, verse 13 says, has been made to drink into one spirit. So not only are we together in Christ, placed there by the agency of the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of God dwells in each one of us. We're made to drink into one spirit. Number five, each part of the body is essential to its proper function. Number six, without some parts, the body loses functions that are important. Really just a corollary of the prior point. Number seven, and very important, God has placed members exactly where he wants them to be. He has sovereignly assigned them their location in the body. Number eight, I'm just, I'm just walking down through the verses again and reviewing the truths with you. If all the members were the same part, there would be no body. At least, at least if you have most of the parts, you have a body. Okay? But if you have only one kind of part, then you don't have a functional body. Uh, now, a body that has many parts, but not all of them, is somewhat hobbled. It's like a body, a human body with an amputation. It has some of its parts missing, but at least it is a body. But if you just have one part, you don't have anything functional. Uh, a bunch of the same parts or one of, of those parts, you have nothing. Number nine, members of the body cannot despise other members of the body. That's not how a body uh, works. Number 10, God gives greater honor to parts that naturally would lack it. And we'll have to kind of dig in and understand what this means. See, what God is doing is he is, through Paul, writing a instructional piece of literature using the metaphor of a human body to apply to the church. So that's kind of easy, I think, to understand or see, but we have to figure out how, do the, how does the metaphor, the parts of the metaphor, apply to the church in, in, its literal, in this literal teaching here, and it's kind of in its meaning. What is it referring to? Number 11, weaker parts of the body are just as necessary. In fact, maybe more necessary than other parts of the body. Less honorable parts, number 12, of the body are given greater honor. Unpresentable parts are given greater modesty. Number 14, God does not intend the body to have any schism. Therefore, he's designed it in the way that he has. So that, you know, parts which lack in some ways are honored more greatly in other ways. The result is number 15 in our list of truths here that members should have a uniform care for one another. A uniform care for one another. Suffering in one part of the body, you know this, right? When your back hurts... You can't just pretend that it doesn't and every other part of your body is fine. Like, oh, I'm just great, you know, 99%. No, except I can't get up out of a chair or roll over in my bed or move. Uh, it affects your whole self, you know. So suffering in one part results in sufferings in all the parts. Rejoicing in one part does, you know, result in rejoicing in all the parts of the body. If you're happy, that helps all of you. Number 18, there are certain gifts that, that are or were given greater prominence in the church to accomplish God's purposes. Those included apostles, prophets, teachers, and then, and then some of the gifts that aren't given today, miracles and healings, then some of the ones that are helps and administrations. Tongues also not given today, but it was early in the church. By the end of the chapter, we see those, those rhetorical questions in verse 29, verses 29 and 30. Uh, teach us very clearly that not everybody has all the gifts. Now remember last week we said no one has no gift. Are you with me? No one has nothing. But we also have to say no one has everything. Okay? And that's what Paul is saying. Not everybody has all these gifts. 
Are all apostles? Obviously not. Are all prophets? Obviously not. Do all speak with tongues? Oh, well, you've got to speak in tongues in order to demonstrate you're saved. That's not what Paul says. Paul is saying in the same breath, no, 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 not everybody has all these gifts. So get off of that crazy idea and follow the meaning of the text of Scripture. Okay? It's like you want the gift that somebody else has because, you know, under the Christmas tree. That's childish. Stop. Don't do that. Okay? Not all the members have all the gifts. Number 20 on my list. There are some gifts that are better than others. I put gifts uh, or better in quotes there. Some that are better than others to accomplish the purposes that God intends for them. And then finally, there is a better way to exercise spiritual gifts. Look at the end of verse 31. But earnestly desire the best gifts. That's where I got the idea that there are better gifts than others. And finally, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Period. End of chapter. And you say, what What happened? Well, read chapter 13 and you find the more excellent way. It's very easy to understand once you get past the idea that the chapter divisions are some kind of sacrosanct division where, you know, one thought from one chapter can't spill over into the other chapter. Uh, They're not hermetically sealed components or boxes like that. So there is a better way to exercise spiritual gifts, and that way is the way of love, which we'll look at when we get to chapter 13. Now, let's go back, look at some details a little bit more. God... In this section is the formation of one body through spirit baptism, okay? Uh, If you've been um, influenced by charismatic teaching, you basically have to take all of that you've learned about spirit baptism and just throw it out, okay? It's not accurate. Trust me, it's not accurate. The body of Christ and the local assembly and the global universal body of Christ, which we do hold to as a, as a true doctrine, is formed by spirit baptism. Okay? Spirit baptism does not convey uh, an extra level of spirituality. It does not result in speaking in tongues. Spirit baptism is how we are all brought together into one body. You don't feel it. Uh, you don't sense it. It's not something that is, is done in a way that is you know, uh, experiential, we call it, or some older theologians would say experimental. That is, that you, that you actually sense it happening, experience it happening. It's not that. And if you want further help on this, I'd encourage you to take the handout. I don't know if you saw it there. I don't have it up here with me. But the handout that I left in the back on the table, one page, both sides, entitled Spirit Baptism. And it looks kind of funny because it starts, I think, with the letter E, Uh, That is a section of notes that I have from a book uh, by John Walvoord on the Holy Spirit. And that section of notes is about 30-some pages or so, and I just extracted those two pages for you and put them out just like that. So you want to know about spirit baptism. There are about eight or nine key points there about it and a whole bunch of Bible verses to help you understand it. And if I have had the time or or if I still have it at the end, I'll go grab one of those and guide us through that later this morning. But uh, we'll hold off on that for the moment. Suffice it for now to say you have plenty of material there and also in what we'll say here this morning. Now God then likens the church to a body, a human body, of which Christ is the head. God has set Christ as the head of the body, Ephesians 4.15. And he says in chapter 5, in instructing husbands and wives, he says about the relationship of the husband as head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. That means the authority, uh, not just the source or origin, but the authority over the church. And this is this idea of spirit baptism is why, or the explanation of how, There can be unity and diversity in the church at the same time. How does God take a bunch of people from different ethnicities, different races, different backgrounds, different educations, different social economic uh, strata, different gifts, personalities, abilities, 
how does he do how does he take all of them and put them into one group of people called the church this is the explanation of how there is diversity joined together in unity so the many become one one body how is it that millions of christian people can make up one body in the universal church or how is it that a hundred people say in our uh, sphere of influence here and membership of the church how can 100 christians make up one local church body and what is that thing that they make up so we'll focus our our attention on the local assembly because that's what we have that's what we that's how we experience the work of god you don't experience the work of god very often i suppose in the global or universal church right i mean you deal with it in, in your local assembly. Each individual does. And we remember again that what happens to one part of the body affects the other parts, just like when our human body is affected by something. The church is a very odd kind of thing in this world. It's similar to other groups of people, but it's different. It's, you know, and some people get kind of mixed up by this. They think, well, the church is a group of people, so it's like a corporation, a corporation uh, or a nonprofit. It's a group of people banded together for some common purpose. And the government kind of looks at us as that because we have features that are like that. But we are not merely a corporation. And if you thought that we were, then you would apply all of the guru books about how to run a business to the church and you would be missing a key element of it. The key element is that we are a body, that we belong to Jesus Christ, and we're a living, growing entity. Now, some could say, well, a group of people can do that. I mean, in, in fact, I've noticed an interesting thing. People love, I think they need, to have some kind of connection and fellowship with other people in some kind of meaningful organization. And when they do that in a non-church setting, they get something, but they don't get everything that they need. So uh, I've seen that in uh, or secular organizations, clubs, um, you know, uh, people who get together and talk, whether it's at the water cooler at work or on the, on the, on the radio or social networks. Next door and Facebook and Twitter and all the you know people getting together and and uh, you know sharing ideas and and interacting with one another and those sorts of things. There's a human need for that, but that it falls short of what the church provides when it's just a secular organization. And when you apply merely secular ideas to the church and try to run it like a business, you fall short of the uh, idea of what the body is. In, in the church. So the church together is a living thing, okay? It's not merely a list of names, okay? So don't look at your church directory and think, ah, there's the church. You've got to think about it more deeply than that. The church is not a list of names. It is a living, dwelling place of God through His Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 uh, Paul said there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that very idea. Let me read it to you in verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that the temple of God, that you, <laughs> you are the temple and the Spirit of God dwells in you? The Spirit of God dwells in you? Or what about 1 Peter? You people are spiritual bricks, spiritual stones built up into a house for God. To dwell in. So God does not only dwell in, and I'll talk about that maybe in a moment, in us individually, but he does corporately in the church. You know, there's no temple in Jerusalem now. Where does God specially dwell? In Fellowship Bible Church. This makes the church a very special kind of thing, doesn't it? It's not just a corporation, not just a nonprofit, not just a group of people banded together. Uh, doing you know things together. Revelation 21.3 tells us that God will dwell in the midst of his people. This is in the eternal state. We have a little 
picture of that now in that he dwells in the church today. The church is an animate... Did I make that clear? Did I... Did I enunciate that clearly? The church is not inanimate. It is an animate thing. It's alive. It's, 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 it's alive. What can I say? It, it moves and, and lives and has being to it. The mechanism to get into the body is that the Holy Spirit baptizes, which means what? In its literal meaning, remember when we spoke about baptism here, it means to immerse. In its metaphorical meaning, it means to what? Also starts with letter I. Immerse is literal. Identify is the metaphor. You've been immersed into the body of Christ. It, you are identified with that body. Whatever else the Spirit does with you, and by the way, what does this text say here? Uh, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. That is inclusive of every single true believer in Jesus Christ. If you believe in Jesus, then you have been baptized into his body. Like I say, you didn't, you, I didn't know that. Well, yeah, if you didn't read your Bible, you didn't know that. If you didn't study your scriptures, you wouldn't know that because you wouldn't feel it. But you were immersed, identified with that body. Whether you're a Jew or Greek, slave or free, that's the mechanism. He attaches you to the body of Christ. And that handout that I have back there gives more details. But when you are baptized, you're baptized into, into Christ and into the body of Christ. The two ways to explain it. You're connected, attached, glued to them. Uh, it's not, again, an event that brings another level of spiritual power. It is how many are combined into one, one body. Now, it happens to all Christians. Notice this phrase here in my Bible set off by uh, long dashes or uh, M dashes. Everybody is, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. Now, this verse, I think is sometimes used to say, in the church there are no more of those distinctions. This verse does not say that, does it? It says all of those kinds of people are baptized into the body, but it does not say that those distinctions magically disappear in the church. They are inconsequential in the church, yes, but they are still realities in the church. When it comes to the composition of the church, they matter not. It is giftedness that determines the role that a person will have in the church. Now, I've kind of, I know I've kind of jumped there. So what if you have some Jews and some Gentiles and some slaves and some free people, some black and some white, some Chinese and some Germans and some Indians and some Aussies and all in the same church. Well, just imagine, from God's perspective, let's suppose you have four people in the church. You have a slave, you have a slaveholder back in the day, okay? You have um, a free person and you have a poor person in the church. Who's going to be the pastor of that church? If you answered slaveholder, wrong answer. The person who should be the pastor of that church should be the person who is called and gifted to be a pastor, and that might be the slave. See, we have this idea like, well, we've got successful business people in the church and doctors and lawyers, and well, they must be the people that need to be in leadership. Maybe not. If they're not called, if they're not gifted, they don't belong. They might just as well sit under the tutelage of the slave who is a pastor, who has a pastor's heart, who knows the word of God and has been gifted by God to be in that position. It is giftedness which determines the role that a person will have in God's household, not ethnicity, not economics, not social standing, 
and, and, and those sorts of things. Does that make sense? Maybe it doesn't make sense to the world, but it makes sense in God's economy. So you might have the slave as the pastor, the free person as a deacon, the slaveholder could serve in some other capacity in the church, and so on and so forth. There are all kinds of combinations of arrangements that could be the case, but God sets those people in the church where and when he wills. And the problem in Corinth was they weren't observing that. They had this kind of business idea or this kind of social economic idea that you know, those at the top of the strata socially are at the top of the church. False, wrong. And that's how we need to, to look at the church. Not in a secular way, not in a, not in a sinful, fleshly kind of way. Finally, in verse 13... The last phrase says, and, so not only were all baptized into one body, so by the way, does any believer have to seek spirit baptism? Too late, it already happened. You can't seek something that already happened, okay? Every believer instantaneously upon salvation is baptized into the body of Christ, and we've all been made to drink into one spirit. Now, the Spirit of God has a ton of ministries which... That handout that I mentioned, again, that is one section of a dozen maybe or more in which are described all the different ministries of the Holy Spirit. He regenerates us. I mean, remember Titus 3.5? We're, we're washed clean, of course, by the blood of the Lamb, but we're washed and regenerated by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the Spirit of God dwells in people who are believers he seals us who are believers, that is, he guarantees our salvation. He teaches us, he illuminates us, he convicts us of sin, he guides us when perplexed. That's the ministry of the Spirit. But another ministry is this, well, what Paul says is this drinking ministry. And I think the drinking ministry is the experiential side of the, ministry, of the Spirit's ministry to us as believers. What does the Spirit of God do? He takes up residence in us to guide us and convict us and teach us and so forth. This is the indwelling ministry. Turn your Bible back to John chapter 7, if you would, please. John chapter 7. And I'll disclose, yes, there's some debate about this verse, these verses, John 7, 37 to 39, but I think there's something more going on here than just a mere non-experiential type of ministry. This drinking is something that you do experience, you do feel, if you will. It does operate a change in your life. And this indwelling is not merely to be thought of in terms of spatial or geographical terms. What do I mean by that? I think we get the idea when we hear, at least some of us, we hear that God dwells in us, that somehow... The Spirit of God is present within the confines of my skin in a different way than He is present uh, over there or over here. Where is the Spirit of God anyway? He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. So then somebody would say, well, He's present here in a special way where He's not there or He's not in the life of the unbeliever thinking of it in terms of a location. It's not a location. Yes, the Spirit of God dwells in us. I take it to be locative in a way, but it's more than that. Not primarily even that. The Spirit is everywhere present so that His indwelling is not an extra mode of omnipresence inside of our physical bodies. Rather, His indwelling is His powerful ministry in the life of the believer. John 7, 37. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. 
That's speaking of this very thing, of drinking into the Spirit. All right, now before we run out of time, let me get on quickly to verses 14 and following. Paul emphasizes in these verses the illustration of the church as one body using a human body. And he, he gives the one many idea with God and his gifts at the center of it. And presumably, we've already alluded to this, but the church in Corinth had problems here. They were not using the gifts of God. They were abusing them. They were not loving the people of God. They were misusing them. 1 Corinthians 13 and 14 will show especially how that is the case. And it shows us that they had a self-centered mindset, a self-centered mindset in the church. Now, I wondered, and perhaps you did as well, what does it mean when it says that one part of the body is weaker than another? Oh, uh, down in verse 22, for instance, the weaker part of the body. What does a less honorable or less presentable part of the body correspond to? What is the meaning of this metaphor? Well, some, just thinking of our own physical bodies, some of the external parts of our own bodies are more or less honorable or presentable. We cover them or not accordingly. But we should not think of parts of the body as merely external parts. Okay? Maybe I, I know this of myself when I think of the parts of the body. I think of just the parts that, like he's illustrated, the eye, the ear, the hand, the foot, you know, the arms, the legs, the torso, those external parts of the body. But that is not all that we should be thinking of. There are some parts of the body that are hidden away that you cannot see, that are extremely important. They include all the internal organs. For example, I suspect that you know that your brain is a very fragile device. It can't take a beating too well. Like, you know, you can sock somebody on the shoulder and it doesn't bother them too much. If you socked your brain like that, the results could be devastating as we know from head injuries, from car accidents, and things of that nature. The brain is a relatively weak organ in, in, in terms of its ability to sustain a hit, unlike you know, your abdominal muscles or something. But the brain, weak as it is, still has a very important function. Who can do without their brain? You know, If only I had one. We need that. It's very important. And so it is hidden away behind the armor of our skull and insulated, for some of us, with our hair. God has put it there for its purposes. But what Paul is doing by talking about the parts of the body and their relative honor and presentability and weakness and strength and all of that is to deal with some attitudes that were happening in the church in Corinth. Yes, it's true, not all gifts are the same. They differ from one another. Some are, are more out front. Some are more hidden. Some are weaker. Some are more necessary. Um, but he's dealing with two attitudes. And for the first attitude, he emphasizes the body is many members. And for the second attitude, he emphasizes that the body is one. That's why we go through this many one, many one thing several times, and you say, why does he keep saying this? Well, listen, look at verses 14 to 19. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. There's his point in this section. And he says, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, or if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. What he's saying is, some people are thinking, because I am an insignificant person, part of the body, I don't really belong. That negative attitude is to be dispatched, removed, drop it. Each part of the body is a part. And no part is not a part. Okay, I'm giving you another kind of double negative thing like I did last week. Nobody has nothing as far as gifts go, and no part is not a part. God has placed each member in the body as he has pleased. Okay, that's what 
18 says, Now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. That is, God has sovereignly assigned you a place. You have a function. Now, whether you possess the right attitude about that function and whether you are actually carrying out your gift is an open question. But without you and everybody like you, there would be no body because the body needs many members. Remember, that's the point here. So the many members idea is meant to deal with those who have a, I'll call it an inferiority complex. I'm kind of small, so I'm, I just don't belong. Wrong idea. And then in verses 20 to 26, Paul says, but now indeed there are many members, yet he's dealt with the many members. Get rid of the inferiority complex, but there's one body. And certain parts of the body that seem to be more important cannot despise other parts of the body and be puffed up about their own place in the church. Remember how the Corinthians were wrong about the Lord's table? Remember that? You know, they had a, a click. They were the haves. And then they had another group, the have-nots. And these people were not allowed to partake in the love feast with these people over here. And these were taking ahead of others. And some were drunk. And these people had nothing. They were despising the church of God. And that was how they were taking of the table in an unworthy manner in that context. The same kind of thinking applies here. You know, I don't need this or that person in the church. Might as well get rid of them. I have got the superior gift. Looking down their noses at those who had been given less showy gifts. No, Paul says again, God has composed the body with parts of greater or lesser honor, more or less presentableness, more or less strength. And who are you? to criticize God's design. Who are you? Just who do you think you are to say, I don't need those people in the church. They're not necessary in the assembly. Who are you not to care about all the parts of the body? Each part serves a purpose. In fact, some parts you may need to be educated about. You know, sometimes, now it's true, there are some people who don't do much in the local assembly. I think that's true. But then there are some other times when certain people in the local assembly say so-and-so doesn't do, you know, doesn't pull their weight. They're not, you know, pulling along in the plow, uh, shouldering their burden. But yet person A doesn't know what person B is actually doing, so they speak out of ignorance. Be careful about speaking out of ignorance. Just make sure you're doing your part. That'd be the best, uh, the better part of wisdom. But all of these different parts of the body of the church are part of that single body. And so what Paul does, the first section was get rid of the inferiority complex. What do you think he's getting rid of here? The superiority complex that some people had in the church. Now, the superiority complex and the inferiority complex are simply expressions of what sin self-centeredness. I was talking with a brother about this before the service. They're just simply expressions of self-centeredness. Woe is me. Or, look at me. Look, knock it off. You need to get over yourself. Whether it's down on yourself or up on yourself, you need to get over yourself. Those complexes are simply self-centeredness. And I might commend to you that idea. Hold that idea in your mind when you hear the secular society talk about self-esteem and, and uh, you know, everything that happened to me and woe is me because of all the stuff that came into my childhood and all these sorts of things, psychology stuff. Self-centeredness. Get your eyes off of yourself and get them on God. Okay? He is your God and Savior. Now, Paul moves to remind the Corinthians of their care and unity, and he tells them at the end of our section here to rejoice with those who rejoice, basically, and weep with those who weep. 
but we're going to have to go a little bit farther to get to the end of the chapter, and we don't have time for that today. So to be continued, just as I had planned, we would. So next time, okay? So hopefully that's helpful to you, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to sit and think about sometime the next week. Think about your connection to, relationship with, your part in, your operation, your function in this body. Ask yourself, am I really acting a part of this body or am I, eh, I need to kind of tune up a little bit and, and get with the program that's la- labeled here, listed here in 1 Corinthians 12. Let's pray. God in heaven, I pray that if you do have a critique of each, of any of us individually and as a church, that we will really take to heart what we've learned here and we will put it into practice. Lord, help us to realize that the church is like a body with the head and with members and it should operate like that. And so ask, help us to ask ourselves if we're, if we're uh, a neck or a pain in the neck. Lord, if we're uh, a back or an aching back in the life of the church, We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.